Mechanical ventilation is an essential procedure in intensive care medicine. Indications of mechanical ventilation include respiratory insufficiency and airway protection. A thorough understanding of mechanical ventilation is essential for anyone who works in this environment. Modern mechanical ventilation is extremely sophisticated, but the basic principles remain the same. In this podcast, we will review these principles and the basic modes and settings that are available. The ideal place to start with the discussion on ventilation is to ask the question, what functions do we want from a ventilator? Firstly, a ventilator needs to be able to breathe for the patient when they can't do it for themselves. Supporting oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange by the lungs is the primary role of ventilation. Secondly, when the patient can breathe, but not sufficiently so, a good ventilator can support the normal breathing of the patient. This ventilator is support, largely in the form of positive pressure applied when the patient initiates a breath can assist transition from full mechanical ventilation to independent respiration. Thirdly, the ventilator should avoid inflicting any harm upon the patient. Good ventilators and ventilation strategies aim to reduce the potential complications. Fourthly, a good ventilator will tell us when something has gone wrong. Finally, An important function of the ventilator is to provide us with information on the status of the patient's lungs, information that can be used to modify ventilation or other management strategies. In essence, ventilation is the delivery of a volume of gas to the patient's lungs and then allowing it to passively flow out. There are two main ways of regulating this process. In the first, A ventilator pushes in a fixed volume of air and the pressure generated within the system is dependent on the characteristics of the system that includes the ventilator circuit, the endotracheal tube, the lungs and the extrapulmonary structures. This mode is known as volume regulated or volume cycled ventilation. In the second approach, the ventilator applies a pressure to the system and the volume that is pushed in is entirely dependent on the same characteristics of the system mentioned previously. This is known as pressure regulated ventilation. It is also sometimes referred to as time cycled as expiration ends after a specific time. In either circumstance, exhalation is passive and relies on the elastance properties of the lung and chest wall, the resistance of the airways and the endotracheal tube and some specific settings in the ventilator. The simplest mode of mechanical ventilation to understand is controlled mandatory ventilation, or CMP. This is a volume regulated mode of ventilation that involves a fixed volume of gas being delivered at a fixed frequency known as the respiratory rate. Once the ventilator has delivered the fixed volume, the ventilator opens its valves and allows passive exhalation to occur. The relative time spent in inspiration and expiration is set by the IE or inspiration-expiration ratio. This is set to a default that roughly reflects normal human physiology, or a ratio of 1 to 2 or 1 to 3. Here's how it works. If you have set the respiratory rate to 10 cycles per minute, Each cycle has to occur in 6 seconds. If the IE ratio has been set to 1 to 2, then in that cycle, inspiration will occur for 2 seconds and expiration will occur over the next 4. Ventilation with a set volume will need to occur within the inspiratory time, so that the shorter the inspiratory time, the faster the inspiratory flow will have to be. If the respiratory rate is increased and the IE ratio remains the same, both the inspiratory time and the expiratory time will be reduced. For example, if the respiratory rate changes to 20, each cycle must now occur in 3 seconds. If the IE ratio remains at 1 to 2, then the inspiratory time will be 1 second 
and the expiratory time will be 2 seconds. The inspiratory flow will have to double. Inspiration can also be split into two distinct phases. The first, called inspiratory flow time, is the phase in which gas is actively flowing into the patient's lungs. In the second, known as the inspiratory pause or inspiratory hold, all flow has stopped with the lungs inflated. This is thought to improve gas distribution within the lungs. Inspiratory time is the sum of both inspiratory flow time and inspiratory pause time. These variables can sometimes be manipulated, though for practical purposes the default settings are more than adequate for most patients and can be ignored. In CMV mode, inspiration and expiration occur strictly according to these settings. In simple terms then, CMV can be set as follows. The volume of gas that is required to be delivered each breath, known as the tidal volume, the frequency at which those breaths are delivered, or the respiratory rate, and finally, the fraction of inspired oxygen, or concentration of oxygen, in the air next to the river. Further settings can then include the proportion of time spent in inspiration and expiration, the profile of the inspiratory breath, and the pressure applied at the end of respiration, known as the PEEP. These concepts will be discussed in a moment. There are advantages and disadvantages to using CMV. CMV is a very simple mode to employ with clear settings and goals. It will also guarantee the minute ventilation generated, allowing fairly precise control of the patient's arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. However, CMV is an uncomfortable mode for patients who are more alert. As previously mentioned, the ventilator does not respond to the patient who is attempting to breathe spontaneously, and this may result in significant distress. As such, patients often require heavy sedation to enable them to tolerate this mode. A further disadvantage of CMV is that if the resistance in the airways increases, or the compliance of the lungs fall, the ventilator simply generates a bigger pressure to deliver the prescribed volume. As we will discuss in a future vodcast, this can result in significant consequences to the patient. To prevent this, an upper pressure limit and alarm is often set. Once this pressure limit is reached, the ventilator will cycle into expiration. While this will potentially protect the lung from further damage, it will also markedly reduce ventilation unless the underlying problem is immediately addressed. Traditional ventilation practices were largely based on anaesthetics. It had long been felt that larger tidal volumes reduced the inevitable collapse of dependent areas of the lung that occur when a patient is intubated. Tidal volumes of 10 to 12 mils per kilo of the ideal body weight were commonly used. In recent years, it has become apparent that the large tidal volumes used may result in overstretching of the alveoli, resulting in damage commonly referred to as volume trauma. Studies in specific patient groups, such as those with acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, have demonstrated that limiting the volumes to less than 7 mils per kilo can improve patient outcomes. Recent meta-analyses suggest that this is also a more appropriate setting in other critically ill patients and has become a widely practised standard of care. Having selected the appropriate volume for the patient, the rate is now selected to control the patient's arterial pressure of carbon dioxide, or more importantly, the arterial pH. Clinical circumstances will largely determine this. In head injured patients, for example, a CO2 in the low normal range is important. For other patients, hyperventilation to subnormal CO2 levels is important in order to control acidosis.
In other circumstances, hypercarbia can be tolerated to avoid worsening lung injury or air trapping. When in doubt, ask a consultant what endpoints for pH and pCO2 are desired. A well-established principle in critical care medicine is to maintain oxygen delivery to the cell. Oxygen delivery is at least in part determined by the saturation of circulating hemoglobin with oxygen. Increasing the fraction of inspired oxygen, known as the FiO2, will in part increase the oxygen delivery. It has also become apparent that oxygen may in fact be harmful. High inspiratory fractions of oxygen have been associated with worsening lung damage. It also results in nitrogen washout, a factor that promotes alveolar collapse. Furthermore, high arterial partial pressures of oxygen may promote vasospasm and cell death. Evidence is accumulating that high partial pressures of oxygen can worsen outcomes in stroke, myocardial infarction and after cardiac arrest. Therefore, targeting an appropriate arterial saturation, but no higher, seems an appropriate strategy. In most patients, targeting saturations higher than 92 to 95 per cent seems acceptable. Ventilators have default settings for IE ratio that are appropriate for most patients. In some patients, pathological processes may result in difficulty in fully expiring. For those patients, such as those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, a longer proportion of time spent in expiration can assist this. In other patients, where collapse of lung tissue results in significant physiological shunt and hypoxia, changing the ratio to one to one, or even an inverse ratio, may assist in recruiting collapsed alveoli. These concepts will be further developed in a later podcast. During exhalation, the ventilator allows the tidal volume to passively exit the lungs. If the ventilator vented this gas directly into the atmosphere, at the end of exhalation the airway pressure would likely be zero. This is known to have a number of consequences, including an increase in the collapse of alveoli and worsening gas exchange. As a result, the application of some level of pressure at the end of expiration, known as positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, has been introduced to prevent derecruitment. PEEP may also have a role in reducing work of breathing for spontaneously breathing patients with chronic airflow limitation or asthma. The ideal setting for PEEP has not clearly been established. PEEP can have beneficial effects on pulmonary recruitment and therefore on oxygenation. However, it may have detrimental effects, including on the cardiovascular system, on venous drainage from the brain, pulmonary hyperinflation and increased shunting. It is rare for patients to have PEEP less than 5 centimetres of water in the ICU. PEEP settings as high as 15 centimetres of water are sometimes used. When in doubt, discuss the best PEEP with a consultant. This concept will be discussed in a later podcast. If a set volume is delivered uniformly over a set inspiratory period, the flow will be a constant. On a flow time graph, this appears as a square wave, a term used to define the profile of the breath. However, some ventilators have been developed to deliver the volume with a different profile. The rationale for this is beyond the scope of this vodcast, and in almost all circumstances, the default option is more than acceptable. Pressure control ventilation is very similar to CMV, differing in that instead of prescribing a specific volume to ventilate the patient, the ventilator delivers a specific pressure. The volume that is delivered is determined by the specific characteristics of the system, the degree of pressure that's set and the time that the pressure is given for.
Similar to CMV, the pressure is applied for a specific period known as the inspiratory time, analogous to the IE ratio. The profile of the inflow can similarly be manipulated by increasing or decreasing the rate that the ventilator achieves the set pressure, known as the ramp time. In practice, this is rarely adjusted. The other settings, such as PEEP, FiO2 and RATE, are set just as they are in controlled mandatory ventilation. The advantage of PCV is that it limits the pressure applied to the lungs and may result in fairer distribution of flow to slow filling lung units. This may be of use in certain pathologies. The potential disadvantage of PCV is that as compliance changes, the volume delivered also changes resulting in marked under or over ventilation. For this reason, setting limits on high and low minute ventilation alarms is very important. Due to the potential for variation in ventilation, it is not the ideal mode for controlling CO2. Mechanical ventilation requires the delivery of a volume of gas to the patient. This can be affected by delivering a fixed volume or a fixed pressure to the patient, while the corresponding variable becomes dependent on the characteristics of the patient and the ventilator system. Controlled mandatory ventilation is the most basic form where tidal volume, rate and an infraction of inspired oxygen are set. The breath is then delivered based on the IE ratio. In upcoming vodcasts, we'll review more advanced airway modes, ventilation safety, the consequences of ventilation, and ventilation strategies in specific circumstances.